Hi everyone, uh, welcome to CNTC seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce you uh, Leo Rezhovsky as a seminar speaker today. Uh, Leo is an expert uh, in condensed matter theory broadly defined. Uh, he worked on topics ranging from soft matter, quantum condensed matter and AMO physics. He did his PhD at Harvard and then a postdoc at uh, University of Chicago then he joined the faculty of physics department in CU Boulder ever since. Besides research, he's also very well known for his uh, dedication to the Boulder Summer School uh, from which many of us are benef benefited. Uh, today he's going to tell us about quantum semantic gauge theory. Uh, please Leo. Well, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you Andrew for inviting me and uh, thanks for everyone uh, attending. Um, so what I want to tell you about is our recent work on uh, quantum semantics. Uh, so let me ask, uh, can you see my cursor here? Yes. Yeah. You can. Okay. I don't know what, I don't have a efficient way of uh, doing uh, Can you, you can try to change it to laser pointer if you want. Uh, I'm on PowerPoint. I don't see where the laser pointer is. Uh, if you, oh. Or oh, spotlight here. I think maybe this is it. Okay. Like that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Let's see. Leo, down in the left, left bottom corner, there is a, there is actually an option to turn this into a laser pointer. Oh, on PowerPoint? Laser. In PowerPoint? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see a pen, but I don't see a, a laser pointer. But anyway, it's it's visible, but there is an option. You see a laser There's a menu right in now? the bottom left corner that pops up and you can change it to a laser pointer. Huh. Okay, but can you see this laser pointer right here? Yeah, it's visible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so I wanna tell you about a recent work uh, on quantum semantics, um, but uh, so this is done with in collaboration with a talented student, student Zai uh, in CU Boulder, who is close to graduating. Uh, so there's a initial work appeared on the archive, and now there's a there's work in preparation with uh, many more details and putting it in a broader context. So let me start out with a kind of a broader introduction, uh, probably superfluous to most of you, but. Uh, uh, I will do ne nevertheless just to be complete. Uh, so, you know, as uh, most states of matter that we encounter in nature are classified by a uh, so-called Landau paradigm uh, where there's a uh, local order parameter that characterizes the state and uh, different states of matter are classified by different patterns of symmetry breaking. But, uh, and so these are the familiar states of matter uh, and are, they're quite well understood. And of course, uh, but there's still plenty of uh, fascinating uh, phenomena that are still fall under this paradigm. But I, what I wanna shift to is, uh, is to focus on where much of the kind of the frontier of uh, uh, hard co condensed matter physics has been uh, for the past 20 or 30 years. And that is, uh, on states of matter that do are not characterized or not do not fall under this Landau order local order parameter paradigm, and so this is what I will call conventional quantum liquids, quantum states, quantum liquid states of matter, and you know again probably this is as the name suggests these are not what uh, for the purposes of this talk this is going to be uh, conventional quantum liquids and uh, will not be the main topic of the talk, but it's a sort of a, uh, a transition to uh, something more exotic that I'm gonna talk about, which are fractons. So these conventional quantum liquids that are still uh, uh, you know, a, a hot topic uh, in condensed matter are motivated by, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, 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 motivated by, experimental, originally they were motivated by uh, anomalies that were observed in some materials, most notably high temperature superconductors, where the standard paradigms of Landau uh, 
uh, of uh, symmetry breaking paradigms and also Fermi liquid paradigm that I have not mentioned uh, seem to be violated, at least in some regimes. And it's still uh, an open question whether there's something new qualitative going on or whether it's more uh, strongly coupled, uh, but quantitatively, just quantitatively distinct regimes. Anyway, so it's become clear uh, that over the last 20, 30 years, that there are uh, theoretical models that are definitely exhibit uh, new phenomena and, uh, and definitely uh, fall outside of the standard Landau paradigm, most notably uh, Tory code and a variety of other models have been developed that, uh, you know, some exactly solvable uh, like the Tory code, which definitely demonstrate that uh, their states, one can have ground states, quantum ground states that are disordered, but nevertheless have an underlying uh, 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 qualitative distinct properties that make them distinct from convention, uh, from, the, from a trivial insulating uh, quantum liquid state, like a parama conventional param paramagnetic state. So these, uh, these systems generally uh, these models generally exhibit non-local uh, uh, quasi-particles that appear at the ends of strings, so anions. They're free to move, uh, so they're, and, and these models exhibit phases where these quasi-particles are deconfined, so they're free to move, but with statistical interactions. These models also exhibit uh, uh, topological order and non-trivial, uh, and, and uh, along with that topological order, comes ground state degeneracy when the model is solved in an untrivial manifold like a torus, uh, uh, or more simply uh, studying the model the, with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, the ground states of these systems are long range entangled and they're typically described by, or have been able, we have been able to describe them, the universal properties using some kind of a gauge theory description. And again, for most of this, you know, you can keep in mind the so-called Tory code, Kitaev's Tory code, that's exactly solvable, well, but there are many, many other models that are, uh, that uh, exhibit these properties, this set of properties. But more recently, attention has shifted into something that seemingly does not fall even into this, into this uh, conventional uh, quantum spin liquid paradigm. And these are the so-called fracton states of matter these are also disordered quantum liquids uh, that have ground state states which are qualitatively different, seem to be qualitatively different from the conventional quantum liquids. Uh, and they exhibit a variety of fascinating properties. The, the simplest model one can keep in mind, uh, mind as I talk about this is the X cube model, which I will not discuss in detail because it's not central to my uh, to my uh, uh, to the talk, but just if you, if you're not familiar with it, then you can look it up. If you're familiar with it, uh, most at this point, pretty much everybody's familiar with it. Here's the the Hamiltonian is defined as a sum of uh, uh, computing commuting projectors, four commuting projectors that are you know A, B, and and then uh, uh, an operator A, and then three other operators B, and they're defined. Uh, the Hamiltonian is the sum of these, and uh, uh, these operators are defined here. So, needless to say, uh, so these these uh, models exhibit non-local fractionalized excitations, uh, much like the conventional spin liquids. Uh, so, however, these uh, excitations are uh, are such that under local spin dynamics, local rules of spin flips these excitations uh, have restricted mobility. So that's one property. The other property is they have exponentially, exponential topological degeneracy and they're believed to, to require a description that's beyond topological quantum field theory description that uh, conventional quantum liquids are described by. So these uh, immobile or uh, uh, excitations of, with a restricted mobility uh, are come with in a variety of types. So the simplest one or the most fundamental one is the fracton. Uh, 
So it's completely immobile. So if you try to move a fracton, you're unable to do it on in the non-shell process. There's simply no local operator that hops a fracton, a single fracton from one side to the next, even in a even though the system is translational invariant. You can create the fracton at any point in, in space. Uh, you can't create it by itself, but you can create it uh, as a as a, a group of fractons and those uh, fractons appear and that's the kind of the fundamental property these excitations appear at corners of an extended object like a membrane illustrated here so if you do want to try to move a fracton you inadvertently uh, if you insist on moving it you inadvertently have to create additional fractons but that process is an off-shell process and therefore is forbidden typically in these models there are other types of excitations which are able to move, but uh, have a restricted mobility. So they, they've been dumped, uh, dubbed as planons, uh, namely excitations that move, uh, confined to move to a plane, or linons that are excitations that are uh, confined to move to a line that's, that's not deformable. So for example, this excitation can move only along straight lines, they cannot turn. So this is all in the way of background. And so these models that I've uh, sort of mentioned here in passing, for example, the X-cube model, the Haas code model, they're described by qubits and they're, they exhibit um, gapped ground states. However, soon after the discussion of uh, an in, in, uh, discovery of these uh, uh, Qubit uh, gapped fracton models. Uh, there's it, it, it was realized that there's another route, qualitative distinct route to fractons, uh, namely through so-called U1 symmetric tensor gauge theories, and the simplest version of a symmetric tensor gauge theory in two plus one dimension. I write down here. It uh, qualitatively it looks very similar to conventional electromagnetism or conventional gauge theory vector gauge theories, it's E squared plus B squared, but the difference is that the canonically conjugate electric field and, uh, and, the, and the corresponding uh, uh, potential A, our gauge potential A are actually uh, uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric tensors. And in the simplest case, these are rank two symmetric tensors. Um, so, so these models, a model like this, uh, naturally has a generalized Gauss's law where the electric field tensor, rather than having a single divergence to give you the charge, uh, the Gauss's law is, uh, involves uh, divergence on both indices. And what's amazing is, so these models have been studied uh, even out, you know, long before, uh, uh, it, they've been studied in high energy phys physics and, and also in the study of uh, quantum spin liquid by, for example, Senke Shu. And, you know, long before sort of fractons came on the scene, but it was not appreciated something that Michael Pretko pointed out, crucially pointed out, that this Gauss's law, um, this double divergence Gauss's law contains in it, uh, it, it succinctly summarizes the or encodes. Uh, immobility of fractons. Yeah, and the reason for that is that this Gauss's law uh, encodes in it not just the conservation of charge, but it also encodes conservation of dipoles, uh, a motion of a charge. And then one notes, as Michael Pretko did in 2016, that motion of a charge uh, corresponds to a creation of a dipole. And since dipoles are conserved in this uh, generalized Gauss's law, that implies that uh, charges cannot move. On the other hand, if you have a dipole, depending on the model or depending on uh, what type of a gauge theory, you, a tensor gauge theory you have, these dipoles can move, but often move in a subdimensional way. For example, move perpendicular to the, or in, in, you know, in the plane perpendicular to orientation of the dipole. Uh, the other development that I was uh, fortunate enough to be involved in is Leo, not, Leo, could, could I stop you for a second? Yes, please. It's just that uh, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I'm supposed to understand this and uh, I kind of yeah, so I'm, track of the thought, right? Yeah. So if I had uh, just, just regular electrodynamics and I had the quadrupolar polarization, quadrupolar moment in my system, mm 
uh, would, would this Gauss's law be, be true essentially? Right, so the, usually density is the uh, divergence of polarization, right? And polarization is divergence of uh, quadrupolar polarization. So it looks like uh, this would be true for just regular quadrupolar polarization. What, 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 but that does it mean the charges cannot move in, in, in regular electrodynamics? I, I'm sure I am saying yeah. something wrong. It's just, in uh, ordinary electrodynamics, dipoles, huh? in ordinary electrodynamics, that the dipoles are not conserved. So you can create, you know, electron hole pair out of vacuum as long as you have the energy to do so. And it doesn't violate any conservation. It doesn't con violate charge con uh, dipole conservation because there's no dipole conservation. The, as long as it's a plus and minus pair, conventional Gauss's law, which is just divergence of electric field equals the charge, only encodes charge conservation. So you can, you can create plus and minus pairs freely. While here, because of the du double divergence, if you know, if you ask about total, if you ask about, um, if you take a region of, of some size and ask what is the, uh, you know, what is the dipole density there, which is going to be a row times the dipole times the separation of those charges, mm -hmm. then uh, that quantity can only change by dipole density flowing in from the boundaries into that region. And that has to do with this double sec, you know, double derivative or double divergence of this quantity. So imagine I, I mean, I don't have this slide here, but imagine I try to um, integrate rho times x. Right, right. That, that's what I'm trying to imagine, of course, right? Uh, and then do partial integration, I guess. But yeah, I, right, right. This, this, is, this is really not, not your point, I guess. Like, let, let me not waste your time. Yeah, so this is sort of, the reason I'm kind of skipping over is it's not central to my, it's only a background, so it's really not central. Yeah, exactly, to exactly. I'll I Google it. Want to put, right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay. But uh, what I'm going to talk about, I just want to put it in kind of a broader context perhaps of interest to people who are, who are uh, doing quantum spin liquids and uh, fracton because it, it was inspired sort of uh, by thinking about these systems uh, as you will see. Um, so the other development that I was uh, part of is uh, observation that in fact, uh, these tensor gauge theories with this double uh, divergence Gauss's law, generalized Gauss's law are in fact dual to elasticity in crystals, where the you can think of stress strains and stresses are uh, dual uh, to the electric field tensors, and the charges in the in the fracton theories are dual to the disclinations, while the dipoles of these of these charges are dual to dislocations. Uh, and for example. Uh, Faraday's law just maps onto uh, Newton's law or, or momentum continuity equation. Uh, so this is kind of an old hat at this point, and so I want to build from this to what I'm going to talk about next. But this is sort of an important background. So the so this is sort of, if you wish, one uh, motivation or one uh, route to what I'm going to talk about. But the others more conventionally have nothing to do with fractons and that's just the observation. There are many physical systems that uh, where one encounters a, uh, even ele quantum electronic systems or, and bosonic systems where one encounters condensation or uh, uh, ordering at a finite wave vector. Uh, and, uh, you know, so like, so, so I'll, you know, so these could be crystals, but they could also be smectic-like objects where there's a collinear-like order and the condensation is a single wave vector or it's multiples. So, for, uh, so one place where this occurs, so I sort of have a laundry list of uh, the kind of systems where this is encountered, uh, which covers a large fraction of condensed matter physics, uh, as a matter of fact. But you know, sort of the most striking example of it, it occurs in the quantum uh, partially filled. Uh, high Landau levels, uh, as first uh, pointed out by Fogler and company and Mosner and company, uh, 
and then further uh, studied by uh, McDonald and Fisher, where you have, uh, and experimentally, I should say, discovered by, uh, and motivated by experiments by Eisenstein, where at low temperatures, below you know, 100, 200 millikelvin temperature, one discovers uh, high anisotro an highly anisotropic transport, uh, which is indicated here. And it occurs near half-filled Landau level, high-filled Landau level, where the interpretation is one develops uh, a stripe-like pattern, which is quantum mechanically fluctuating, of n plus 1 n and n plus 1 alternating uh, fillings. Uh, these uh, kind of smectic, so I call this, this is really truly a quantum uh, smectic in the sense of uh, that it breaks translational and rotational symmetry spontaneously to the extent that it's only weakly coupled to the underlying crystal lattice because the density of the electrons in these systems is far lower than the density of ions uh, uh, of the underlying crystal. Uh, the other examples where this has been argued that they're smectic and all kinds of uh, uh, stripe-like water that occurs are in doped mod insulators. Uh, one can also think of, you know, ordering of a spin density wave, charge density wave, or pair density wave in some kind of a stripe pattern. Something that I studied in the different context uh, of spin orbit coupled Bose gases, or and in uh, resonant. Uh, imbalanced uh, Fermi gases uh, interacting with Feshbach resonances. Uh, although this has never been seen, uh, this, this seems to be, as I've argued in the number of works, this seems to be a natural playground for realization of a full de ferro larkin of Chinnikov state, which is also another example of these kind of a stripe-like, smectic-like phenomena, and more generally, li quantum liquid crystal phenomena. And so this, uh, and of course, there's frustrated magnets that also have helical-like uh, structures, which one can think of as the sort of a spin density wave. And the key, crucial point is that the wavelength at which this ordering occurs is far longer than the underlying crystalline lattice. So then its quantum fluctuations are not restricted or not suppressed by, by pinning to underlying crystal. So this motivated and so so with this introduction uh let me sh uh shift to the main part of the talk uh uh and so so this is the outline of the talk i i've already covered the crystal elasticity tends to gauge theory duality or in, in, in or at least i i've mentioned it so now what i want to really talk about is uh is the subject so i'm gonna first i'm gonna quickly tell you about a reformulation and much, in my view, much nicer reformulation of the uh, crystal, uh, crystal elasticity gauge theory duality uh, by reformulating it into a, uh, into a duality into a vector gauge theory, but these are gonna be coupled vector gauge theories. Uh, so this is a much nicer formulation just because we have, uh, it, it's a cleaner, formulation uh, of this duality. And in particular, it's, it, it dualizes a crystal into uh, a vector gauge theory, which are much more familiar and have, we have, or at least I have more intuition for. And then I'm gonna get into the heart of the talk, uh, talking about quantum smectics and applying this vector gauge theory duality to treat a quantum smectic. And then I will discuss how this quantum smectic and this duality allows us to describe a melting of a, of a crystal into a smectic and a melting of a smectic into a pneumatic on this dual side. And so really this picture right here summarizes everything you need to know. Well, summarizes the, the sort of the punchline of the talk or summarizes at least the subject of the talk. So let me then start. So first let me review uh, something that I've talked about uh, on a number of occasions, namely uh, elasticity to vector gauge theory duality. So, and in fact, I wanna point out that in fact, this came, this version of duality, although with Michael Prepka, we developed the tensor gauge theory duality uh, and uh, together, 
this version of duality is the is the thing that I came up with first, simply because, uh, uh, well, it was it was more natural thing to think about these vector gauge theories rather than tensor gauge theories. But then I got diverted from it, from this uh, kind of a uh, from this theme by realizing that Michael Pretko has demonstrated that the tensor gauge theories are the ones that exhibit uh, uh, fractal behavior, and so uh, my focus has shifted. Uh, to work with uh, Michael on the tensor gauge theories. But now I want to go back and tell you about the vector gauge theory duality, which, which is an equivalent reformulation of fracton gauge theories, fracton and gauge theory. So su suppose you, so first observation I want to make is imagine you have an XY model and that XY model maps onto a vector gauge, conventional vector gauge theory. So if you had many uh, flavored XY models, namely just decoupled uh, XY models model uh, labeled by index K, then that maps onto not, not, tr trivially onto vector gauge theories. And these, of course, do not exhibit any kind of a fracton phenomena. They have charges that appear at the ends of strings. And therefore they, you know, at best they can have deconfined phases, but in any ant, but uh, they don't have uh, restricted mobility quasi particles. But there's a sense in which, and the reason I was motivated by this and the reason I introduced it like this, there's a sense in which elasticity, where uh, the main object of the symmetric strain tensor is really, uh, is kind of a uh, funny version, uh, or I, I like to think of it as a spin orbit coupled flavored XY model. Why do I say this? Because in an ordinary XY model, you have some Goldstone mode phi, well, here you have the, the analog of the Goldstone mode is the, or, or the Goldstone mode is the displacement uh, phonon U sub K, it's labeled by K. And what appears is the gradient of that phonon mode. But the difference is that the a crucial important difference is that rather than just having space, which is I indicated by I and K is the flavor being completely decoupled, uh, underlying rotational invariance of the system demands that what really appears is the symmetric combination of you know a symmetric symmetrized version of this uh, unsymmetrized stra strain tensor di uk plus dk ui and that in a sense introduces or in a real sense a flavor space coupling because i'm allowed to now contract both the i and the k indices between each other so that's what makes it uh, that's what encodes the underlying rotational symmetry. And so that's in fact what leads to, that's what makes the UIK, namely the symmetrized strain tensor, a fundamental object in the elasticity theory. And that's what leads to the tensor gauge theory for element, uh, fundamentally. But so how, how can you avoid this? And so the way to avoid this is to rewrite or reformulate elasticity uh, that's been written in terms of symmetric strain tensor in a slightly different way, you, you introduce, you, you work with a non-symmetrized strain tensor, D, DI UK or gradient UK. So it looks very much like this flavored XY model, but you project out in this energetic way or gauge out, Higgs out the anti-symmetric part of the strain tensor. And you can do this the way we do in gauge theories. You simply subtract out theta times epsilon i k, what that does is at low energies, if you think of this as a minimal coupling between matter field, phase field u, and the gauge field theta, anti-symmetric gauge field theta epsilon i k, what it does is it higgses out the anti-symmetric part of this strain tensor and only leaves the symmetric part. So now, having ref so now you can reformulate this symmetric strain tensor theory of elasticity in terms of really a flavored gauge theory, a flavored XY model. So there's a UKs, they have, there's a gradients of them. There's a canonical conjugate momentum. And now, now you have to introduce a sector for the bond variable theta. Theta is really just a bond variable. And so that's just a rotor model that describes uh, quantum dynamics of the of the bond variable theta. So really what you have in here is in two plus one dimension, you really have three XY models. There's a bond variable XY model 
coupled to uh, coupled to the two other XY models, the UX U sub X XY model and UI XY model, coupled in this very funny way. And so, given that we know that this crystals map onto a fractonic tensor gauge theories, we're guaranteed that this model formulated in terms of coupled flavored XY models will map onto, will give you vector gauge theories, which will be coupled in such a way that you get uh, fractonic gauge theory. And so, it, so again, just to reemphasize this, what this coupling does or this symmetrization does is encode rotational invariance, underlying rotation invariance in the target space of the underlying of the crystal. So the crystal can be rotated by a large angle, by arbitrary angle that corresponds to transformation on UX and UI. It's very non-trivial transformation, which is kept invariant by either this theory or this theory. And this has been recently also explored uh, at the linear level in, uh, in trying to build quantum field theory for fractonic models by Cyborg and company. So, uh, so here's the, so we have this reformulation of elasticity in terms of flavored XY models. So now we can just turn the crank and do standard XY gauge theory duality. If you do this, you just follow your nose and you just repeat sort of seminal papers on uh, uh, mapping XY model onto a gauge theory, conventional gauge theory, but keeping track of this coupling. And when you do this, it dualizes, not surprisingly, to, to, to three coupled gauge theories. Um, so there's a gauge theory uh, for the little e and a little a. There's a gauge theory, vector gauge theory for, I'll call it capital E, capital A, cup, uh, labeled by K and K can be X and Y, or sometimes I call them A and B. Uh, so these, so if there was no coupling here, like, then this would be just 3D coupled um, vector gauge theories, but this coupling uh, is the coupling that really captures, well, is the reflection of the underlying coupling between rotations and translations in this form, reformulation of elasticity, which is in the end responsible for all the interesting uh, fractonic physics of this vector gauge theory, of these coupled vector gauge theory. Uh, the Gauss, so one observation is, uh, that's quite interesting is that the coupling is kind of like the minimal coupling, except it's a minimal couple, your matter field rather than being a zero form, it's now a one form, it's a vector. And it's, and then it's, uh, so the, as far as this coupling is concerned that this little a gauge field acts like a matter field with respect to the, uh, with respect to this capital A gauge field, which is now an anti-symmetric part, which is defined here of this AIK tensor. And so you can think of this as a one form matter field coupled to a two form gauge field a, I, J, and the symmetrized. And the other crucial thing is that's, uh, that this uh, Hamiltonian is supplemented with is the Gauss's law. There, there's the standard Gauss's law for the, for the little, uh, gauge, little E gauge field, electric field, where S is the disclinations or the charges that are, frac that are, that are the fractonic charges. And then, but then the divergence of the flavored electric field, the capital E sub K, it, it's, it charges uh, the dipoles, P sub K, but also the electric field lines of the, of the little E field. You see there's a, this P tilde includes electric field lines. So then one can immediately see why there's fracton uh, immobility that appears. If you try to move the charge S, then you generate electric field lines but those electric field lines appear as charges to the second Gauss's law for the capital E. And as a result, you would be violating this Gauss's law if, the, if this charge would move because you'd create electric field lines which are charges for this Gauss's law. There's a gauge uh, redundancy, standard gauge redundancy chi for, 
for the for the for the capital gauge theory, capital A, the capital vector potential, but the for the little vector potential, its magnetic field is actually not gauge ga, gauge invariant, and so uh, well because it's coupled for the for this to this capital A and the symmetric part of this capital A, and it has it has standard gauge transformation, but in addition, if you have a chi transformation on the capital uh, A, you have also a shift of little a by a chi. Okay, so there's this generalized gauge transformation that this theory obeys. Um, if you demand this gauge invariance of this theory, you immediately uh, discover that a, a conservation law for dipoles, that conservation of law for dipoles is in fact broken. So you have a time derivative of the dipole moment plus the current divergence of the current, but the right-hand side, it violates this conservation law and it corresponds to a motion of disclinations or motion of fractons. So it's a statement that this conservation law says that the, when fractons move or disclinations move, they generate uh, dipoles by their very motion. And so immediately this tells you if you have no dipoles, that implies that J, uh, the charges have to have a zero current. Are there any questions at this point? It's okay. Uh, I'll take that as a, I'm being crystal clear or I've lost everybody. I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, I, I'm getting thumbs up, so. Uh, so, uh, so you can, with my, my, Michael Hermely, we reformulated this model. We, uh, well, first we generalize it to uh, general D dimensions. This mapping comes about from, uh, fr uh, from doing this duality. But once you have this general uh, Lagrangian or general Hamiltonian, you can very easily, even though you cannot derive it from a D dimensional elasticity theory, I can only do it from D plus one dimensional elasticity theory. Once you have it, you can formulate it in arbitrary D dimensions and still re, and it sort of get, it now gives you a way to construct D dimensional uh, fracton models using coupled vector gauge theories. So I don't really have time to, to discuss this in detail. And again, this is just sort of on the way to something I'm gonna talk about something, you know, it, it's sort of a side, uh, 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 it, it, it's sort of a, uh, it's not the central part to the, to what I'm going to talk about. So I'm not, let me just skip over it. I, the only thing I want to say is that there's an D there's a, in, even in D dimensions, now that we've learned how to do this, that you can write down a D dimensional lattice model, lattice models for D dimensional fractons uh, formulated in terms of coupled vector gauge theories. And again, a crucial ingredient here is that the, magnetic field, magnetic flux density of the little a field that lives on the plaquette is not gauge invariant and needs to be supplemented by antisymmetric combination of the capital A vector field. Okay, so if you, once you have these theories, you can now study, you know, you, you, can, you can now study not just the phases, but phase transitions. And in particular, one of the things that I've done at some point uh, together with Michael Pretko and my student, student Tsai, uh, we studied melting of this kind of a theory and then uh, melting of a crystal by condensation of, or Higgs transition. Well, melting of a, melting of a crystal corresponds to condensation of dipoles, but in the, uh, in the, on the gauge theory side, it, it corresponds to a Higgs transition, which if you condense both types of blue, uh, you know, the X and the Y dipoles uh, or dislocations, you go to a hexatic, hexatic phase. And Leo, I thought, uh, Leo yeah. can I ask you a question? Just yeah. the, about like one thing you said a minute ago about this D-dimensional thing. Yeah. Um, can you just do the dualization story in higher dimensions? Like you, instead of getting vector gauge theory, you get some higher form anti-symmetric. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, uh, 
So Michael Pretko and uh, Shriya Pai have done this. Uh, soon after we did our tensor gauge theory, they decided to go off and do a high dimensional version of what Michael Pretko and I did. Hmm. Uh, and indeed you get, uh, you get a very kind of a complicated looking theory, which involves both symmetric and anti-symmetric. You, you have both the forms, form gauge fields and symmetric tensor gauge fields. Hmm. It's a very complicated, uh, object simply because in high dimensions, things like dislocations and inclinations are now lines. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but, but in, in this approach, you do the duality in two plus one dimension, but then having learned the properties right. of the corresponding coupled vector gauge theories, you can just very, in a very obvious way, generalize it to D, D right. dimension. Right. And the generalization is just simply in D dimensions, you're going to have one underlying gauge theory, little a, and then it's coupled to D uh, vector gauge theories, and it's coupled through an intersymmetric part like this. And that's it, that's really all it is. And you can see here, like you have this gate, you, you'll have like the little a gauge field be, looks like a matter field that hops from let's say this, this uh, center, a bond to this center bond and associated with this is the gauge field AXY, which, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is a connection of hopping of this vector object from, from this bond to this bond. Then you need a tensor or AXY to, to ex execute that hop to make it gauge invariant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this naturally brings you to thinking about phases and phase transitions. And we've developed the phase diagram where dislocations unbind both types of dislocations unbind at the same at the same time, and when they do, what you get is a tr phase transition from a crystal to a hexatic to a superfluid. And the reason there's all superfluidity enters the game is because, in addition to dislocations and disclinations, you have also once dislocations unbind, you also have pairs of dislocations, which are the quadrupoles that Dima mentioned, and those are vacancies and interstitials, and those guys. You need to include you need to include this quantum dynamics and statistics of those objects. And those objects, you know, if I take them to be bosons, then those I have to decide whether those bosons both condense or uh, or whether they're mod insulating. When they're mod insulating, you get a commensurate crystal, and you get uh, uh, you get uh, or you can if when they both condense, you get a super solid. So there's a way to describe these phases of matter uh, that are indicated in this phase diagram in this generalized vortex mobility versus dislocation mobility phase diagram. So building on this, what I want to now turn to, and I'm quickly running out, out of time, I see, to what uh, the main subject of the talk is of what happens if you take this crystal, quantum crystal, and you melt it, but you melt it by just unbinding one type of a dislocation, not both. And so let me just imagine I unbind X dislocations, what I get is a smectic rather than crystal. Namely, I re, I uh, restore translation, when I buy in X dislocations, I restore translation symmetry in the X direction, but I retain translation symmetry in the Y direction. Uh, and so this is one thing one can do, and, uh, and it's of interest to understand this transition, but one can approach this using duality. So what one can do is one can dualize the quantum crystal into a, uh, into a vector gauge theory, coupled vector gauge theory that I indicated on in a previous slide. And then one can do a Higgs transition on the Y matter or Y dipoles of that Higgs theory. And what one gets is the quantum smectic uh, vector gauge theory description of a, of a quantum smectic. Alternatively, one can just write down a theory of a quantum smectic and then dualize it. And one of course gets by self consistency to the same to the same vector gauge theory description of a quantum smectic and the advantage is now we have like a, a very detailed understanding of these phase transitions namely from a quantum crystal to a quantum smectic and then also to a pneumatic and so again so what do you do well you start out with a crystal and you condense x dislocations and you, what you get is a super smectic and the super again is because when you have dislocations, then the pairs of those makes vacancy interstitials that it can, in principle, both condense. Well, if these guys have both condensed, 
then uh, vacancies in interstitials have to both condense. So this by necessity is a quantum supersymmetric. And then you can go further and then, so now X dislocations have dis, uh, has condensed. One can now can condense Y dislocations and go to a, to a quantum pneumatic. And so let me now describe for you a route to the quantum smectic. So, so a way on the, on the elasticity side, the way you describe a smectic is the same way that I motivated describing a crystal. You have an X, Y, you have an X, Y model for the U, Y degree of freedom. That's the only phonon degree of freedom that's available in the, in the smectic state. And you gauge it, you, you gauge it or Higgs it with the rotational degree of freedom, which is the bond variable or orientation of these layers. So these layers have some direction or layer normal and the fluctuations of that layer normal is the theta degree of freedom. And so now you couple this XY model to the, to the XY model corresponding to the re reorientation of the smectic layers. And the reason you do that is precisely to, just like for the crystal that I talked about, to encode rotational invariance, underlying rotational invariance of the smectic. If this coupling was not there, then you'd simply have two decoupled XY models and it would be, uh, you know, it'd be a very simple problem that we already know how to treat and there would be no restricted mobility in that system. And in addition, just, just uh, for, uh, explicitly I write down that there's also uh, the super part of it that there's a vacancy interstitials, namely atoms that are uh, bosonic atoms that can, that are in principle both can both condense or not. So for the, for the rest of the talk, I will not explicitly mention these underlying uh, superfluid sector uh, and only focus on the smectic sector. So what do you do? Well, you, you just go through and turn the crank and this is detailed in, in, this, in, in, the, in these two papers, in the archive article that I posted uh, a month ago. Uh, but then there's a detailed paper that's uh, about to, to be submitted. If you turn the crank on this, what you get is again a coupled uh, vector gauge theories. There's a capital E vector gauge theory, and it's coupled to the little e a vector gauge theory, and it's coupled in this in this funny minimal coupling way. And there's a Gauss's law, and it looks very similar to the Gauss's law for the crystal, except uh, only the x component of the electric field appears as the charges of the capital E electric field. And so this already anticipates there's gonna be some restricted mobility of the charges in the X direction of this theory. And so there's a, Gauss, there's a gauge redundancy and the, Gauss, uh, the continuity equation, if you just demand this gauge invariant, you get continuity equation for the dipoles which is violated by the motion of the charges in the X direction. And so from this, you get that the charges cannot move in the X direction. And the way one can visualize this, if one goes back to the elasticity theory from which this came, one can understand where that comes from microscopically. And that's simply imagine a dislocation. It's hard to draw a discl single disclination. It's hard to talk about single disclination in a smectic it's just tough to visualize it because it completely rotates the layers by 90 degrees. So, so it's best to think about a disclination or charges, pair of charges that make up a dipole, which is a dislocation. So here's a non-elementary dislocation, which is, which is whose Burgers vector is 5D. So it's Burgers vector is five layer spacings, which just means I separated these by a non-elementary, non-unit cell amount. So now imagine I try to move this one end of this relative, you know, a positive charge relative to the negative charge or a positive disclination relative to the negative disclination. I try to move it along the uh, smectic layers. So what happens is when I do that, I have to introduce additional layers. So if I moved it from by four lattice constants, I have to introduce four additional layers and four additional layers is really a non-local process. It's not, uh, you know, for in the in the state where dislocations are gapped, there there's no condensative dislocations. There's really no local process within the smectic 
that allows you to go from this state to this state. And this is what encodes, this is what, uh, this, this is immobility along x direction is encoded in fact by this uh, continuity equation. Any questions about this? So in the sense one could say disclinations are line on like objects in, two, in the two plus one dimensional symmetric in that they can only move in the y direction perpendicular to symmetric layers, but they cannot move along symmetric layers. So that's the claim. Okay, one can also do hydrodynamics of this uh, uh, of this, uh, so one can take these two continuity equations for the charges and for the for the dipoles, and the and the fact that the dipole conservation law is violated by the motion of the charges j sub along the x direction, and you can turn the crank and work through the write down fixed law for the dipoles, write down the fixed law for the charges. Uh, uh, in the in the y direction, but the, there's no fixed law for the current in the in the x direction of the charges, and lo and behold, what you get is uh, anomalous hydrodynamics or anomalous diffusion, where the rather than having standard k squared diffusion, uh, the relaxation kernel being k squared, it's k squared in the y direction, but in the x direction, it goes as kx to the fourth. And so that, that leads to the anomalously slow dynamics of the charge relaxation in this in this metric. Okay, so now I wanna, in the remaining 10 minutes, I wanna turn to a phase transition. So here's our uh, crystal gauge theory, dual gauge theory. So if I wanna now describe a transition from a crystal to a smectic, what I do is I, rather than having just background charges, I introduce core energies and kinetic energies for these charges. I make the charges, uh, particularly dipole charges, J, be dynamical. And I do that by softening up this model and rewriting it in this, uh, as a, you know, as a Ginsburg-Landau-like quantum Ginsburg-Landau theory. I mean, I don't have to, you know, you can actually derive this object by simply making the, uh, introducing uh, kinetic energy for the charges, for the dipole charges, and then, uh, and then getting a theory that looks like a abelian Higgs model of these, uh, of the matter field, which now represent the dipoles, minimally coupled to this gauge field, the capital A gauge field. So the dipoles of flavor K are coupled to the gauge field, capital A sub K. So when you, and so now it's very simple what, you, what to do. You simply allow this, to, and so this is some potential that describes uh, you know, the energetics of the dipole condensation of the X dipoles and the Y dipoles of dipoles of flavor K. So all you do now is just simply uh, condense the, the Y dipoles while leaving the X dipoles uncondensed. And what that does is it hexes out or gaps out the a the y flavor of the gauge field appearing here. When you do that, what you get is to lowest order, sort of in mean field theory description. If you're just trying to get the phases right, uh, what you get is you just simply set take this Hamiltonian and set a y equal to zero. And so what you remain what remains is just the x flavor gauge field and the little a gauge field. And that by construction is really what you expect to get is the, is the coupled vector gauge theory description of the quantum smectic. And indeed, when, you, when the dust settles and you, when you do this, what you, what you uncover is the vector gauge theory for coupled vector gauge theory for the quantum smectic that we obtained through a different route, through a duality route that I, that I described here, or at least I stated here. So you get exactly the same uh, structure as we did uh, by, by uh, condensing the Y dipoles inside the crystal. 
Uh, Leo, could I ask a question? Yes. Um, so in this language, it's kind of natural to imagine uh, condensing some object or so, some dipoles like with higher charge um, without condensing the charge one dipoles. So, you know, say I did uh, charge two. Um, is, does, and so then you might expect some kind of strange um, uh, feature with the mobility of the disclinations where maybe they can move some distance two, but not distance one. Does that have any physical interpretation in the elas elasticity theory? Yeah, so this is exactly the kind of question I've been, I've asked uh, some time ago. And, you know, it, you're exactly, you know, you, your answer is exactly right in that uh, uh, you get, it, it's not, I have not found any kind of a um, convincing realization of that kind of a, of that kind of a state in the context of a crystal or elasticity. Uh, but indeed, what you said is correct. You end up getting uh, a state which is a liquid or, you know, or smectic in this context in which uh, dislocations can only move by every other, you know, by, by two lattice constants rather than one lattice constant. And, and but, but I, it, it, it seems quite unnatural from the elasticity side point of view, but you know maybe it's just for my lack of creativity. But I have not been able to think of a way to realize something like this on the on the elasticity side. Thanks. Uh, okay, so now that you have the smectic, you can uh, complete the second part of the phase diagram, and you can go from the smectic to a pneumatic. Uh, by very similar uh, procedure, you simply take the, this dual gauge theory with the Maxwell term and the matter field, you elevate the matter field for the dipoles, you ignore the disclinations, the, the charges, you take the dislocations, you elevate them to uh, dynamical charges uh, by introducing kinetic energies in, uh, and core energies, you soften up the model you get the, you soften up the model. So then now you have an abelian Higgs model. So you have the Maxwell term. The Maxwell term is just this, that's this. And then you have a minimally coupled uh, X dipoles, uh, which are described by the Psi. I dropped the X here for simplicity notation. Psi describes the X dipoles, which will, which are the Y dislocations, which will condense when you go from the smectic to a pneumatic, and they're minimally coupled to the to this vector potential of just the a sub uh, a sub y vector potential, <coughs> which you know I, I I don't in the smectic I don't indicate the the flavor because there's only one flavor left. So if you could again, so so this a sub y gets uh, higgs. So yeah, sorry I misspoke. So a sub y gets higgs when you go from a crystal to the smectic, so then that retains only A sub X in the, in the resulting smectic theory. And that A sub X, I, I dropped the label on. And so now when I go to the smectic theory, now I'm gonna Higgs out the A sub X gauge field by condensing uh, X dipoles. And when I condense those X dipoles, lo and behold, what happens is, and you can just sort of read it off here, if I condense the condense x dipole a, x dipoles, then this guy becomes gapped. I can just integrate it out, and what's left is just this little e and little a sector of the theory, and that's indeed what I get. And that sector of the theory is just coupled to the charges, to the underlying charges, which are, used to be the disclinations. And not surprisingly, this is just the conventional vector gauge theory that you would get if you just dualized the, the pneumatic phase, which is just this remaining rotor degree of freedom of the orientational degree of freedom of the pneumatic. So this is, as not surprisingly, is just the gauge theory, conventional vector gauge theory corresponding to the pneumatic. Um, okay, so just to summarize, I'm almost on time. Uh, 
So I talked about fractal elasticity duality and mo motivated in part by that uh, and, uh, and, and as well as uh, realizations of, uh, of smectics uh, in quantum smectics and variety of physical quantum systems such as, uh, you know, most notably uh, 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 the partially filled uh, fractional quantum Hall state or partially filled uh, high Landau levels, uh, but uh, and frustrated magnets. I discussed uh, with you uh, a du uh, dual theory or gauge theory description of a smectic and used it to describe phase transitions from a quantum crystal to a quantum smectic and from a quantum smectic to a pneumatic, all in terms of uh, uh, various types of Higgs transitions. Uh, so here's the summary of sort of what I talked about in terms of kind of a flow chart. You can either, you can take the crystal, you can melt it into a quantum, into a smectic and then dualize it and you get a vector gauge theory. Equivalently, you can take the uh, already previously developed vector gauge theory description of quantum crystal and then do a Higgs transition to go to, to a smectic. And then you can have further uh, Higgsing of the remaining uh, dipoles to go to a pneumatic. So there, there's a variety of uh, things that I'm thinking about now. So this gauge theory, this coupled gauge theory is quite novel. And, uh, and although of course in mean field theory, it's easy to analyze, uh, I don't really understand yet it's true criticality, critical behavior in the same way that there's an, uh, you know, there's a, there was a problem in the seventies of analyzing, uh, uh, normal to, uh, to, uh, to superconductor transition, let's say in three dimensions, uh, namely the critical properties of the Abelian Higgs model. There's a fluctuation driven first order transition discovered by, you know, uh, on one hand, Coleman, uh, on the other hand, uh, Halpern, Lubensky, Ma. There are similar questions of criticality of really details of the criticality of these Higgs transitions and these coupled vector gauge theories. Uh, as uh, another notable thing to think about is uh, quantum Hall smectics. So the, even though I use as my motivation, these Eisenstein experiments of partially filled high Landau levels, those object, those uh, systems break time reversal symmetry and they have different dynamics than the ones that I considered. I consider the uh, systems that don't break time reversal and don't have this uh, guiding center dynamics. So things change when you look at, uh, those quantum Hall smectics. And so that's, that's still an open, open problem that is very naturally follows and to be explored uh, uh, from here. Uh, there's a question of something called commensurate smectic and elastic nonlinearities that are, if you ask me about it, I can elaborate on. But with this, let me stop and thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks Leo, and now it's open to questions. Uh, maybe I can ask the, uh, <coughs> the first question. Uh, so what is this uh, elastic uh, nonlinearity? Well, so um, if you're in a smectic state, let me go back. <coughs> this is something actually, in fact, I was just discussing with Mason. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I don't have it on the slide, so but let me let me maybe. Uh, let me use a pencil to. Well, uh, let me just say it in words. So, uh, in a smectic, when I write down elasticity of a smectic, you know the the description of Goldstone modes of a smectic, in fact harmonic elasticity, we're so used to in the XY model being able to uh, being able to describe things in terms of a harmonic theory. Uh, oops. Sorry. Um, I don't know what is a good place to yeah, there's no, I don't have a, 
Okay, so in in when, whenever we have a Goldstone mode, for most Goldstone mode theories, uh, it's sufficient to 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 treat it at a harmonic level. It turns out for for a smectic, in fact, uh, the the elasticity of a smectic must include a description of a smectic must include nonlinearities, and those nonlinearities can be important within the phase, and they can also be important at the transition. And so what I've done is so far is approximated the smectic. Let me do it here by a harmonic theory here. So this is purely harmonic. And that's an approximation that, uh, that may fail, uh, you know, at the transition and it may fail in the phase. And, uh, and so, uh, so the question is, is to include these high order nonlinearities uh, of the goals of the smectic goldstone mode. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you might have some turn like a cosine turn or just a- not, They're not cosine terms. These terms look like they actually are, <coughs> sorry, do they look like, you know, at a classical level, you know, you have smectic elasticity looks like this. So it's this uh, this encodes nonlinear. This encodes underlying rotational invariance of the smectic layers. That so you can run the layers this way. Oops, this is really. Uh, you can run layers this way, or you can run layers this way, and that should not cost any energy. But in addition, there's a compressional energy. Which at harmonic order just looks like the UDZ, and that corresponds to compression of the layers. But in fact, you need to include nonlinearities that look like this. If you want to, if if you really want to include full rotational invariance, this term just encodes infinitesimal rotations. If you rotate by an infinitesimal angle theta, such that u goes to theta times x, where theta is small, then this is sufficient to uh, sufficiently encoded by this. But if you want to have a large rotation, then you need this nonlinearity, the second term here, and this is the fully rotationally invariant strain tensor for large rotations, which will not be, uh, which, which if, you, if you ignore the second term, which uh, will not preserve rotational invariance. And so this is the nonlinearity I'm talking about right here. <clears throat> I see. Okay, thanks, Dio. Oh, is there any other question? Oh, uh, hi, Yangzi. I, I think, I, this is Jay, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so so, uh, so we, we, you, you mostly focused on the quantum uh, part, but it's, it feels like there is a, a lot, uh, this also tells us things about conventional like classical elasticity theory. I mean, basically if we really talked about, because the picture you showed was in some sense, uh, two-dimensional classical elasticity of the disclination dipole story. So, uh, so, so what, what, I, I mean, and that should constrain the three, the quantum critical behavior too, by like uh, basically find crossover uh, behavior. So is there, uh, can, yeah, uh, so, so, so can you review that or? So I don't quite, I didn't quite follow the question. Uh, Oh, okay, so I, I'm just saying that the, 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 I guess I'm just asking what, what does this tell us about the classical elasticity? Uh, like uh, like uh, the classical behavior of the same system, which would be finite temperature. Well, so th that's a really good question. So there's an outstanding question out there, even in the classical smectics, namely, what is the nature of the phase transition from the pneumatic phase to a smectic phase? 
Mm -hmm. And this is a problem just in classical physics. You have an orientationally ordered phase, pneumatic phase, <clears throat> and you undergo a transition to a symmetric layered phase. This is a problem that uh, plagued uh, and challenged some of the best, you know, sort of fathers of the field, you know, from people like Lubensky, Bert Halperin, and uh, David Nelson, John Toner, and, you know, and it's been attacked in, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Mm. And if you wish, so, and in particular, John Toner has a, had an approach to it as a, <clears throat> to this problem, which is in terms of dislocation loop unbinding, much like Castle Salas, except in three dimensions of dislocation loop unbinding. He, uh, so he starts out with a smectic, introduces dislocation loops, gets a Coulomb gas of these dislocation loops, and then maps it onto some kind of a very funny uh, three dimensional classical, you know, uh, gauge theory or Bill and Higgs model, but, mm -hmm. but some, with some funny looking Maxwell term. And he analyzed that theory and studied its critical properties. So mm -hmm. what our theory does in electrostatic limit, it reproduces that theory. Ah. If I go to okay. a classical limit and generalize it from two plus one to just three plus zero dimension, I reproduce Toner's theory with Toner's model, which he then analyzed. Ah, okay. Now that's, uh, yeah, that's very helpful. But I was also thinking about just the two plus zero dimensional, like if, if instead of the quantum- well, just two plus to, zero uh, dimensional yeah. state, it, it's just, it's an efficient way to calculate, but we know a lot about two plus zero dimensional state. The two plus zero dimensional mm -hmm. symmetric state at finite temperature is unstable to proliferation of dislocations. It's just simply mm -hmm. unstable. So really what you get okay. is a long crossover. Like if you start out with a smectic at longer scales, you will get uh, dis dislocations proliferating. And so what you really get is a pneumatic, which is mm -hmm. will be quasi long range ordered because it's, it becomes an X, Y model. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's so, the, so you reproduce all that physics. All right. Okay. I, uh, is there any question? Yeah, I had a quick question, I think. Um, so I, I was realizing actually, are these gauge fields you're considering here compact or non-compact? Uh, they are not compact. If, if, uh, if, if you want it to be compact, you have to do it on the lattice. Mm -hmm. So if you have a substrate, then substrate will make these gauge fields compact. So for example, if you have a, oh, okay. if you have a orientational substrate, substrate that say, so you can do it in two stages. So for example, imagine you introduce a substrate, which just, which is incommensurate with the underlying translationally incommensurate, but it has some direction, obviously. So it's, it's some rubbing in some direction then it will make the um, uh, little, uh, it'll make the little gauge fields, E and A, compact. It'll make the little A gauge field compact. Okay, so, so, so in that case, so if you start doing that, let's say you make only one of the gauge fields compact, um, then, uh, then you have to start worrying about monopole proliferation and things like that. What, what happens, and presumably there's some instability to monopole proliferation in this theory? Um, That's true, yeah, 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 there is. Uh, and that just corresponds to pinning by the substrate. That's really how I think of it. Okay. But in the, okay. It's very physical. It's just, it's just a, this highfalutin gauge theory uh, encoding of the fact that if you have a substrate, that substrate will, uh, you know, will uh, uh, the relevance of that substrate is just proliferation of those monopoles. Okay. And then if nice. you make substrate also translationally commensurate, then you can have a, then you will have proliferation of monopoles associated with the capital A gauge field. I see. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, is there any quick question? Actually, let me maybe add to that a little bit. So if you have an orientational substrate, the fact that monopoles always proliferate will, uh, <clears throat> will get rid of the little H gauge, gauge field, mm 
And then what you will have remaining is just a capital A gauge field. And that capital A gauge field is just a XY model. It's just a dual of an XY model. And that's exactly what you should get if you had no underlying rotational invariance, like you do, like for example, in a charge density wave, incremental charge density wave, where you only break translational symmetry, but rotational symmetry is already broken by the underlying crystal. And so there, the problem is much simpler because then that is just an XY model for the, you know, the unidirectional charge density wave. And then that uh, has no underlying, uh, you know, it just maps onto a vector, conventional vector gauge theory, single vector gauge theory. Is there an analogous statement if you um, uh, have a substrate that, that uh, pins one of your big A gauge fields? Or sorry, that, that um, causes yeah, proliferation so for one of the big A gauge fields? Yeah, so that's just a commensurate uh, translationally commensurate uh, uh, substrate, which just removes all the Goldstone modes and just gives you, an, you know, sort of an Ising model. You know, gives you, gives you, uh, you know, if if it pins it in a commensability one way, then there's nothing left. But if it pins it at some uh, commensability p, then you have a p state like clock model uh, remaining. Okay, uh, is there any quick question? If not, let's thank Leo again. Okay, and thank uh, you. Uh, so for people who have a uh, meeting schedule with Leo will be on this Zoom. And Leo, uh, you can stay and uh, uh, the first discussion is with me and uh, that will start at in 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good, I'll take a little break. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.